feel like I am being forced into an immoral situation. Passionate pleas over bathroom privacy, hundreds fighting for and against a transgender student's right to use whichever facility they choose. Yeah, Kim, it really could set a precedent, and that's one of the reasons that people were so passionate when they packed the room behind me, about 350 people here, and they were emotional but respectful, and overall this is an issue pitting privacy against tolerance. Dylan Ulmer came out to the world tonight. Dylan used to go to school in the Poway district before getting bullied for being transgender. I was assigned female at birth. Now? I'm kind of just Out here. Okay. <laughs> Dylan doesn't identify as a man or woman, a term known as gender queer. Dylan felt it was important to speak for the rights of other transgender students to use any bathroom they like and not feel forced to use a gender neutral one if the district installs them. And if we choose not to use it and instead choose the um, the, uh, the restroom or locker room that corresponds with our gender identity, um, I feel as though we should not be outed for that. Those who oppose the integration of transgender students are likely basing their beliefs on fear and a lack of understanding. I feel very uncomfortable having to change for PE in a locker room where there is a student who has a female, female body. I feel like I am being forced into an immoral situation. Morality is a key issue for some on the other side. I came directly for rights to privacy. Sierra White is one of them. Besides privacy, another big concern for her, safety. People have been attacked or looked at. Um, there are always sick-minded people that take advantage of this kind of system. A system still very much up for debate nationwide and a decision that could set a precedent for other districts throughout the country. Private changing facilities in each um, locker room or restroom would solve the problem. Transgender students are people just like you and me. Well, the U.S. government may have another way of spying on possible suspects, or just about anyone at all for that matter, by getting information out of any device or appliance connected to the internet. Here's how it works. These days, anything from cars to televisions to household appliances like refrigerators to cell phones and more can be connected to the internet. It's called the Internet of Things. And James Clapper, the director of national intelligence, told the Senate that the government could hack into the Internet of Things and get all kinds of information. So your refrigerator could be watching you in the future. The government's plan could easily create new concerns about privacy in the digital age. The Capitol, O-M-G-O-D. An Arizona representative says he's being discriminated against because he won't use the word God in the opening prayer. This is the memo stirring the pot in the House of Representatives, and notice the date it came out, January 27th. That happens to be the day after those angry tweets from a Phoenix City Councilman about Satanists giving their opening prayer. This time, it's state legislators splitting hairs over what counts as a prayer. Today, I ask for us all the grace to shout. That's Representative Juan Mendez leading the invocation in 2014. I ask that we seek the inspiration we find in each other to make our voices heard. At the time, each representative was asked to lead the opening prayer once a year. Then you might say all hell broke loose. The last two years, Mendez says he's been silenced, not for what he said, but rather what he's not saying. If you're going to be giving the prayer, then you have to acknowledge a higher power. In a memo from House Majority Leader Steve Montenegro, who now approves requests to lead the invocation, he defines prayer as a solemn request for guidance and help from God. Mendez is an atheist. Asking everybody to, to recognize the, the higher power that we have in, our, in ourselves. The memo also states no faith will be excluded, but Mendez says he certainly doesn't feel included and neither do his supporters. I mean, I feel disenfranchised. Uh, my constituents feel disenfranchised. It all comes down to wording, and Mendez worries fighting over the definition of invocation will end up silencing everyone. And they're forcing us down this way, we're probably going to lose it the same way that the city council lost it. Word of Justice Scalia's death brought many admirers out to the Supreme Court on a cold night to honor his life, his legacy, and his service to the country as the longest serving member of the court. It's never too cold to remember a man as warm as Antonin Scalia, and he was. He was a man of deep personal Christian faith. I had had many conversations with him over the years, and I was with him in church. The last time I saw him was in church. And uh, I will tell you, he was a unique man. There'll never be another Antonin Scalia. Whether people like him or not, like his decisions here on the court or not, he made a uh, 
a, a lasting uh, mark on the history of this country. Some of the most important cases we're facing as a nation are before this court this term. Religious freedom, abortion, immigration. Uh, and now, um, we hate to say it, but I have the court behind me, the Capitol across the street. This is now going to become a political issue. And so we will clearly be praying for our President Obama, for the Senate, and praying that we get a person like Justice Scalia. While many here in Washington and around the country mourn his passing, Scalia's sudden death crystallizes just what's at stake in the 2016 presidential and Senate races. A presidency lasts four, possibly eight years. Supreme Court picks last a lifetime. We're going to turn now to a disturbing investigation at an elementary school near Washington, D.C. A teacher's aide there has been charged with sexually abusing students. The police say that they know of 10 victims, but that could more than double. 22-year-old Deontay Carraway was a paid teacher's assistant and the director of a youth choir. Police believe that during the school day at this elementary school in Glen Arden, Maryland, and at this aquatic center, he was videotaping sexual acts between minors and sexually abusing some of the victims, ranging in age from 9 to 13. So far, detectives say they have uncovered approximately 40 videos. A victim's relative called police after discovering a nude photo sent via the messaging app Kick on the child's cell phone. Kick allows users to remain anonymous. A lawsuit has been filed alleging that the abuse was common knowledge at school and that the principal refuse to take any action. Pope Francis is making his third visit to the Americas. This time, he's in Mexico, the world's second most populous Catholic nation. A growing number of Mexicans are leaving the Catholic faith, and the Pope is hoping to use his visit to convince them to stay faithful to the church. Pope Francis visits a country that has been a stronghold of Catholicism for centuries. As of 2010, Mexico's Catholic population was the second largest in the world after Brazil. Most Mexicans embrace Catholicism. The faith is part of their family heritage. It's deeply rooted in the country's culture and history. Here at the Basilica of Guadalupe, millions of Catholic Mexicans gather every year to pay homage to the Lady of Guadalupe, the country's patron saint. But the number of Catholics here in Mexico is on decline. Many Catholics like Sara have left the faith. She was born into a Catholic family. By 17, she had already fulfilled all the required religious rites. But soon she realized she wasn't getting closer to God. At 17 years old, I still had an emptiness in my heart. I had no desire to live. For me, it was better to die than to live. A friend of my mother told me, I'm taking you to this place. She never mentioned church but she brought me to church. That day, the pastor was preaching and he said a word that touched my heart. Thousands of Mexicans, like Sara, are embracing evangelical Christianity. In 1970, 96% of Mexicans claim to be Catholic. Today, that figure stands at less than 85%. One reason for the decline? Evangelical leaders are spiritually closer to their flock. Surveys have found an average of one Catholic priest for every 6,000 Catholics in Mexico, compared to one evangelical pastor for every 200 followers. Other reasons Mexicans have left Catholicism include evangelical outreach and the tarnished image of the Catholic Church. We must recognize that certain scandals have caused many to be disappointed by the church and to seek a different spirituality. The work of the Evangelical Christian Church in evangelism has been successful in past few decades. Many have come to hear a different message that brings peace, harmony, blessing and salvation to human beings. With a record number of people here now embracing Evangelical Christianity, Pope Francis is hoping his visit will re-energize his flock and keep Mexicans faithful to the Catholic Church.
we haven't had a very collective notion of these are our children. So part of it is we have to break through our kind of private idea that kids belong to their parents or kids belong to their families and recognize that kids belong to whole communities. Once it's everybody's responsibility and not just the households, then we start making better investments. I want every agency to lean forward. Lean forward. Big Brother wants to be called Big Daddy now. Paul Joseph Watson writes, the U.S. Department of Education and the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services has published a draft document which outlines a plan that will treat families as equal partners in the raising of children, opening the door for government intrusion at all levels. The document states, the first step in systematically embedding effective family engagement practices in educational settings is to establish a culture where families are seen as assets and partners in children's development, learning, and wellness. The first two principles of effective family engagement practices state, one, create continuity for children and families, implement a vision for family engagement that begins prenatally and continues across settings and throughout a child's developmental and educational experiences. Number two, value equal partnerships between families and professionals combine professional expertise with familial expertise to promote shared learning and responsibility for children's healthy development learning and wellness encourage two-way communication by valuing family input on all aspects of the child's life and development including their culture traditions and home language well that's nice of them isn't it principle number four states ensure constant monitoring and communication regarding children's social, emotional, and behavioral health. The paper describes how government employees will intervene to provide monitoring goals for children at home and the classroom, and that if parents are failing to meet the standard set, evidence-based parenting interventions will be made to ensure that children's social, emotional, and behavioral needs are met. Will there be home visits, you ask? Well, the document states, home visits. To support ongoing relationship building with families, programs and schools should conduct periodic home visits so that teachers and families can get to know each other and communicate about children's goals, strengths, challenges and progress. If home visits are not possible for all families, school or programs should require that teachers or providers and families communicate at the beginning of the year to ensure that the relationship is started in a positive way. The program bears the hallmarks of the controversial scheme in Scotland set to take effect later this year under which a shadow parent appointed by the government will monitor the upbringing of every child under the age of 18. The document also extends the understanding of the word family to include all the people who play a role in the child's life, a definition that could include not only teachers, but government monitors. In a related development, the federal government is pushing for a task force to oversee a program under which pediatricians and doctors would screen all students over 12 years old regularly for depression and issue prescriptions or treatment as necessary. Obviously, the program will increase the likelihood of teenagers being given dangerous antidepressant drugs such as Prozac and Lexapro. This bold new world order draft declaration is nothing less than a declaration of war on American families by pedophilic government overseers brought to you by the Obama administration, the very same administration that criminally wielded the power of the IRS and the NSA on their political adversaries. This is a big deal.